biggest moments. The Xfinity 10G Network, the best way to stream live sports, and presented by great clips in sports. Success is about team effort, and the same is true for your hair. Great clips. It's going to be great. Coach Steve Kerr joins us. Coach, how are you this afternoon? I'm good. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. You know, I have been forewarned and told time and time again, Dan, ease into this conversation with the coach. Don't hit him over the head about Kaminga and what he said about the referee. So we've been talking about hard knocks and Coach Mike McDaniel. Would you ever, if there ever presented itself where there was a hard knock NBA and they allowed cameras and microphones into the locker room or behind the scenes, is that something you would ever give the nod to? Oh, I would want no part of that. No part. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds miserable. Uh, you know, there's just so much stuff that happens in practice um, that you, um, you know, you, you want to keep in-house and you, you, you want an environment where the players can trust you. And, and uh, if, there, if there's cameras there all the time, it's just uh, it, it compromises that, that sanctity that, that you need where the players feel safe and you can actually – coach and not have to worry about anything getting out. Steve, F.E. Santangelo here. Good to hear your voice, man, and uh, excited for the way your team excited for the way your team is playing right now. It, it, it seems like, in talking to my friends and going to the game the other night and watching you guys, that you're playing with a different energy, a different vibe. And you know as well as anybody, I'm preaching to the choir how important that is throughout the course of a long season when you guys live together, um, you play on Christmas together. Just talk about how things have changed maybe in the last couple of weeks and maybe why things have changed in the last couple of weeks. Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we did change the starting lineup, which I think changed the vibe a little bit. Um, you know, we, um, we, we struggled for the first 20 games. We just couldn't find any momentum and it just felt like the right time to make a, a lineup shift and, I think, um, you know, it, that, that shift coincided with, um, you know, with Draymond's suspension. And it, I think maybe we had a little bit of clarity at least, you know, whereas the first weeks of the season, everything just seemed jumbled. Like we just couldn't find any, any momentum. And when Draymond went out and, and we made the, the shift, um, it sort of gave us a little chance, a chance to, you know, kind of say, all right, let's let's see what we've got here with this lineup, and and we'll go from here. And and the guys have settled in pretty nicely, and we're on a decent stretch now. You talked about the new lineup, and certainly we've seen Pajemski who's been able to respond, and Jonathan Kaminga, who is playing his best basketball to date. And you've alluded to how things have slowed down for him. When Draymond does return, and obviously there's a lot of math involved here, but who is the odd man out? Well, I mean, uh, it, it, the one thing I've learned in, in coaching is you, you don't have to make those decisions until you have to. And so, and circumstances change all the time. So we don't even know when Draymond's coming back. So to sit here and, and speculate and think, well, who's going to be in, who's going to be out, it, it's, um, it's not worth the time. Um, w w once everything unfolds, then you have to make the decision you have a lot more information, you know, who's healthy, you know, who's playing well, all that stuff. So right now, the way I look at it, we've got a deep team, got a lot of guys who I'm very confident in, and uh, we'll just take it game by game and see, see who we play. There's something cool, Steve, about watching a young kid get his chance and then realizing through some successes that he can play at this level, that, that, that my game plays at this level. In the evolution of Brandon Pajemski this year, like I love this guy. We, we have a term in baseball, like that guy's a baseball player, meaning like mm -hmm. he's down and dirty, he's a gamer. Like this is my favorite guy right now. Like you're, he's starting, you're giving him minutes at the end of the game, he's stealing the ball, he's diving all over the court, he's playing defense, he's making clutch threes. Maybe talk about him for a second because I just love the way this kid plays. He's a basketball player, FP. I mean, it's, we use the same term only for our sport. I mean, he's just he's just a basketball player, and and, uh, and the way that manifests itself is uh, both sides of the floor. He's just uh, when you watch plays unfold, it's almost like if if you were in a hundred uh, hundred meter dash, and the guy shoots the gun, and one guy jumps the gun. Um, you know, he's the one who jumps the gun. Brandon jumps the gun on, on every play. Only, only it's perfectly legal in basketball and, and in fact, encouraged. Uh, but when you watch a play unfold, shots.
Rob goes up, he's the first guy to chase the rebound. And, he, you know, the, everybody else is a half count later. That's why he gets so many long rebounds at both ends of the floor. Same way on the cut, same way, you know, reading plays. He just has a knack and he's got a feel and he's also fearless. So he's, he's you know, he's going to take uh, and make big shots and make big plays. And um, and if he doesn't, if he misses, he, he doesn't care. He, he, he does it again the next time. So, yeah, total gamer. Those are things you can't teach, right? Well, not really, not really. You know, I mean, it's um, you you try to teach them. Um, because they're, you know, they're such effective, um, dynamics when you, when you think about a way, uh, a way to play and you show guys tape and you say, Hey, look at this. You know, what if you did that? But some guys are going to do it. Some guys are going to, are not going to do it. And he comes in with maybe one year of college experience and, uh, one redshirt year and he's already doing all that stuff. So he just got a nap. Is he soaking it all in? I mean, is he a good rookie? He's listening to Steph, listening to Clay, listening to Draymond, listening to you, obviously. I mean, is, is, is he is he is he willing to learn? Yeah, yeah, he's he's definitely willing to learn. You know, we coach him. We don't uh, we don't take it easy on him. Um, the vets don't take it easy on him, and uh, so he, uh, you know, he he does his duties. So if the vets tell him to go get donuts, he goes and gets donuts. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, he you know he thinks he's the best player on the floor, so it's a it's a good combination. You, you know, do, you do as you're told, but you got a little swag too. So I like that. Coach Kerr joins us on this Warrior Wednesday, and Coach, the other rookie that obviously has had an impact is Trace Jackson Davis. Can you just talk about the difference between having a guy who's been at a school like Indiana for four years as opposed to somebody who comes out a little bit earlier? Yeah, well, you know, just the fact that. I mean, it's hard to even think about this, but um, Trace is two years older than Moses and Jonathan Kaminga, so um, he, you don't you just you don't picture it that way because he's a rookie and those guys are in their third years. But you know that's the advantage of of uh, playing a lot of games. It's to me, it's very similar to to the NFL. You know, you you look at the trend of quarterbacks, the Brock Purdy types who played, you know, started 40 games in college or whatever the number is, that stuff matters because you're seeing these pictures and the game is happening so fast. And, you know, really the only way to, to feel it is to go through it. And um, that's how I see Trace, 125-plus college games. Uh, was coached by an NBA coach and Mike Woodson, you know, at IU. And uh, came in here just – with a, a good foundation for his game and he's, he's showing he's ready for this now and he's really been impactful and he's helping us win games. Look at us. We're talking about young players talking to Steve Kerr. Nice enough to join us on 95, seven, the game. We've been talking about Jonathan Kaminga for three hours, Steve, I'm getting sick of it, but the quotes and we were reading them and I know you want your guys to be confident. I know you guys, you wouldn't be happy if guys were excited about getting pulled from the game. Like you want your guys to want to play. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm assuming this, but we also had a saying that like, we wanted to keep things in the locker room. We wanted to keep things within the family. And once it gets out to jokers like us that talk about it for three hours on a radio <laughs> show, now you got to deal with it. And, and there's been a lot of things and I don't want to get into them recently that maybe have leaked out, but you guys are such a storied organization with such deep tradition and such championship pedigree that uh, are, is there a part of you that wishes that he would have come to you and said that, and maybe not to a reporter? No, I wasn't really offended by the the comments. You know, I, I think uh, J.K. Uh, meant well. I, I, you know, I think it may have come come out uh, maybe a little differently than he intended, but um, it's all good. I mean, we talk every day, and um, you know, he knows um, when, when I pull him aside and I show him film. I, I show him exactly what he needs to do to to do better and and to get more playing time. So um, the uh, the comments are what they are. Not a big deal. Um, you know, we, we just move forward. The, the biggest thing for me is, is J.K. just continuing to grow and develop. And uh, he's doing a great job of that this year. I think he's made big strides. Um, most of the stuff is, is just kind of little detailed stuff that, um, frankly, unless you're watching tape of the game and picking it apart as a basketball nerd, um, may not recognize. But it's, it's what we do as coaches, and, and those are the, the things that lead to winning and losing. So, 
you know, we're, we're showing him all this stuff and trying to help him get better. And, and he's working hard and, and I think he's gotten much better this year. I'm really excited about his growth. Coach, staying with Jonathan Kaminga for a moment, it's clear watching him play now how things look as though they have slowed down for him, for lack of a, a better phrase. Is that one of those things where you, he's now seeing things, whereas maybe a year ago or a month ago that weren't necessarily there? D- does that happen organically? I, I know it's certainly things, as you mentioned, are pointed out, but is that just something where, where the light has to go on for a young player? Yeah, but it has to go on with daily work, and and you know that's um, that's what what JK has been doing. That's what our developmental staff uh, has been doing every day. You know, pre practice. That's what we do during practice. Um, you, you show them the pictures, and and you you preach what you're trying to uh, trying to do as a team, and uh, and then it just. It comes when it comes, and, and what I'm excited about is I'm, what I'm seeing the last couple of weeks is that it's starting to come. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, any play where J.K. is catching the ball on the perimeter now, um, he's immediately swinging it, and that's led over the last few games. It's led to open jumpers for Steph and Clay. And that may not sound like much, but you know, early in the season. And in his first couple of years, usually on catch, he, he would hold it a, a second or two and, and wouldn't recognize the swing. And so we work on that every day in practice. So it's starting to click. And now all of a sudden, you know, the offense is opening up. Everything in this game is about quick decision-making. It really is a decision-making sport. And the defense moves so fast that uh, it just takes time for most young players to recognize what the decision is, what the correct decision is, dribble, pass, or shoot. Those are the three options. But uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's usually the case with young players that uh, decision-making is the hardest part because the defense is moving quickly. And if the decision is made slowly, then you lose the advantage offensively. And that's, that's the play that he's starting to make now more often. And that's what's gotten me excited. The defense that they're legislating out of the game. I was so pissed off on Christmas Day, and I, I'm so glad you had the ass in the press conference, too, afterwards, because <laughs> I, I, I did, too, watching at home. It, it took away from a, a great game between the two defending champions, and now it's a free-throw shooting contest, and, and we're, we're milking calls. I mean, I, I love what you said after the game, and I'm glad you said it. Well, I appreciate it. There was some frustration involved there, um, but... Um... You know, I, I think the league is really good about um, listening to people and, and, and trying to get the, the product to the best place. And I know that this is a feeling that um, I share with my other 29 coaches. You know, um, we, we all feel the same way, that the officials do a great job. They work so hard and they, they're, you know, but it's, it's the detail of, of, you know, what how we're going to teach them that is the most important thing. And so, you know, what I said the other day, I really believe that, that players are really smart and they're just trying to manipulate calls. And, um, and I don't blame them. If they can get away with it, they should do it. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, two years ago when Chris Paul was playing for OKC, he did the swipe through, you know, the swipe through and the team's in the bonus, yeah. you know, where he's got the ball. Yeah. So he swipes through underneath our defender's arm, you know, 40 feet from the hoop and the ref calls it and like, we make eye contact as, as Chris goes to the line and I kind of roll my eyes and, and he looks at me and goes, Hey, as long as they call it, I'm going to keep doing it. And, uh, and I said, I don't blame you. You should, you know? And, and, uh, and that's the point is that um, the players are just smart. And if they can game the system, they're going to game the system. And I just think it's, it's on us. You know, we're all kind of stewards of the league, coaches, GMs, owners, um, it's on us to really try to put the best product out there. And I just think it's a good time for for us to take a look at this and, and get rid of some of this stuff. Do the rest play the name game, Steve? Because I know like strike zones were different. I'm hitting 220. I'm getting everything called on me. Somebody, a big name gets up there and, and their strike zone is different. Do, they, do NBA refs play that game, in your opinion? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, – I think it's it's human nature that you know if Steph's got you know five fouls and it's late in the game and there's a questionable call, I think it's human nature for the officials to not call it. I mean it, it's um, 
I don't think I don't think it's like some big conspiracy. I just think this is, you know, it, it's it's human nature. Now, if there is a a, a foul, then they're going to call it. I mean, I, I don't think there's any any of that stuff going on. Um, but it's it's more just the human nature stuff where if there's something shaky, questionable, eh, you know, let's let it go. Let's let the players decide. And I and I agree with that. Coach, to that point of human nature, uh, stay with me here. I know this is a bit of a reach, but the intimacy in basketball, where it's obviously just 10 guys on the floor as opposed to football and baseball, where you don't see the ongoing conversations during a timeout or certainly during a free throw where these these relationships are forged, whether it's Scott Foster or Chris Paul or Tony Brothers or whomever. And back to that human nature, you're just, you know, you're, you're either going to like a guy or dislike a guy like we all do. And does that compromise calls? And do you think that at some point, uh, I've always, <laughs> I, I would love to see it mandated where, you know, let's, let's just remove the referees. Let's just stop with the intimacy and, and the ongoing conversation and getting to know one another so that this can be more from an objective lens. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really in agreement with that. I think a few years ago the refs were – we're told, you know, not to communicate with players and, you know, try to be you know, just more objective. The problem is in, in, in basketball, I think it's different from, from baseball. I think in basketball, every play is open for debate. Every play is subjective. And, and you know, you they're, they're a block charge call, you know, if, if we ask 10 people in a room, it's going to be split five and five. And so I think there's, there's so much feel that has to be had and as an NBA official. And I think if anything, um, you know, we've tried to make it um, too robotic and too, too black and white. And um, I, I think it's, it's, it's an impossible job. It really is, especially today because there's 20 cameras at every game and you, the, the viewer at home gets five different replays from different angles. And you could make a case on almost every play that they, that the, the ref got it wrong, but, in my in my view, that's why the refs have to have more feel, and it has to be more situational and not, oh, hey, this is a foul and this is not, because every play is different and every play's got circumstances and nuances that are different from the previous one. Coach, one, one just a quick follow up on that. It you talked about how at, at times it's uh, you you reference it's hard to watch or you wouldn't watch that, and I know a lot of that was the emotion speaking, but. I can tell you as a fan that, and this isn't just relegated to the Warriors, but just basketball in general, there are times where, you know, the, the stoppage of play and the over-refereeing and the, the, you know, the disruption of what is the fluidity of basketball, which is arguably the best athletes going up and down the floor, but every 10 seconds there's a stoppage. And how many times do we see a player move his feet and raise their hands and as the whistle's blown, they're staying with their hands raised in this incredulous look of, what the hell do you want me to do? Like, defense now has gotten to the point where I'm with the player. I don't exactly know what it is that I'm supposed to do. And I think the refereeing has gotten to the point now where just from, you know, just generally speaking, from an entertainment perspective, it's so disruptive, It at times it's hard to watch. Well, you know, it, it, it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a really difficult job um these are the best athletes in the world and they're going fast and you know you, you can't call a foul on every play because you want the game to be fluid um on the other hand you you can't let guys get away with with stuff um you enter you know replay into it um where we're replaying a lot of different stuff and there's a lot of stoppages it can be frustrating uh for fans and that's really the trick is how do we how do we create what's best for the 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 product, you know, that what's best for the, the sanctity of the game, but also the viewership and, and what people like to see, the flow of the game. And that's the idea. That's what we all have to try to get to. Steve, I was I was debating whether to ask you this or not walking in today, but, but it, this is more of a personal thing for me and just kind of wanting to know. I was watching Last Dance this week, and it was on ESPN. I don't know if you were aware. And you were on there, and you were talking about Dennis Rodman. And you were talking about when he took off the time and he went to Vegas um, and, and kind of how Michael handled it with Phil. Have you, not that Draymond's anything like Dennis Rodman, but obviously there's some issues right now and he stepped away from basketball. Have you leaned on any of those experiences as a teammate with Dennis or maybe even as Phil as your head coach? 
on how you guys handled that thing with him because I used to love that guy, man. He played so hard. He left his heart on the court every night. He was there for you guys. You won championships together. Those are the similarities I see with Draymond, that they both care a lot. Have you, have you used any of those experiences with Rodman as a teammate to address the situation that's at hand right now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Phil Jackson was the, the master, the then master. You know, I mean, he was uh, one of the most brilliant coaches in any sport. And um, the reason was his ability to handle any type of personality and, and get the most out of his players. And and it was really, um, it wasn't some formula. It was just uh, his personality, his flexibility, his emotional IQ, uh, his awareness, and um, and it was always a collaboration, and I think that's what I've taken most from Phil is, you know, you turn it into a collaboration uh, with your players where they know that, you know, they have a lot of say. They also know that uh, the coach is, you know, in the end, the boss, but that this is this is about finding the right path and working together, and that's why I loved playing for Phil so much, and that's why I've tried to emulate him in in many ways as a coach as well, because I know how, how powerful that, um, that style can be. You know, Coach, FP and I were talking about this earlier in the show about how you just can't go after today's players. Like you back in the day with Lute Olsen or even the Bobby Knight days of just getting in the guy's grill, that that just doesn't resonate with the athlete in 2023. So I've always been curious when it comes to the turnovers. How do you in this day and age become that authoritarian figure and still walking that fine line of making sure you don't you don't lose today's athlete. Yeah. Well, first of all, thankfully those days are gone. You know, <laughs> I mean, honestly. Yeah. I mean, no, nobody nobody really benefited <laughs> from having a demeaning coach. You know, let's be honest. Was that really motivating, or was that humiliating? And nobody really was the, the better for that. Um, so I, I just think we're in an era where there's much more respect. Um, from coaches to athletes, um, but you can't give up the mantle of of being the, the person in charge. You, you still have to have the authority, and uh, and you do that through um, your, your just your daily uh, rituals, through your daily work, uh, going to practice what the what the players feel every day, uh, what the film sessions are like. When it's done like Greg Popovich does it, like Phil Jackson did it. Uh, where it's respectful, um, where it's collaborative, where it's, you know, hey, this is what we're working towards and we're going to take care of everybody. But, you know, man, we're going we're gonna to work and we're going to do everything possible to win because it is, for us, the most important thing right now today to get this right. If you can strike that balance and that tone, then, then I think it, it all clicks, and that's, that's what we try to do here. Coach, we appreciate the time as always. Thanks so much, and we'll get back to you next week. All right. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. Yeah, good luck tomorrow night against the Heat. All right. Appreciate it. It's awesome, man. He's a different cat. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I have been for a long time. And it goes, it goes deeper. I've said it a couple times today on the show. It goes deeper than him as a basketball coach. It's just Steve Kerr the person. Like, I've I, always appreciated I, I just, it. Yeah. He, he, he's more than a basketball coach to me. He's... It's not just all about sports. It's about people. I and mean, not just people in his locker room. It's about people, period. Like, I, 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 yeah, that was cool. I've interviewed him before on the other station, but that was really cool. I, I was nervous to ask that question about Rodman because I think there's some similarities. Yeah, sorry. There's some similarities uh, between the two. And, and maybe Rodman was a little more wild off the court, but I don't really know what Draymond's thing is off the court. I don't know what he does when he's away from, it's not like he's he's taking a vacation right now to go to Vegas. And if you don't know the story, that's like awesome. he he asked Can Phil, Dennis that? Rodman in the middle of the season asked Phil if he could go to Vegas for forty eight hours. He was dating Carmen Electra at the time, so they went to, and Michael Jack, Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan during during the, 